We're back with some cast commentary reading. Um, we are, I believe, on part two, the arbitrary construction of human divisions. Chapter four. <clears throat> day after day, the curtain rises on a stage of epic proportions, one that has been running for centuries. The actors wear the costumes of their predecessors and inhabit the roles assigned to them. The people in these roles are not the characters they play, but they have played the roles long enough to incorporate the roles into their very being, to merge the assignment with their inner selves and how they are seen in the world. Oh, that makes so much sense. Just that first, done, done. I have to, ah, God, analogies on analogies. Whew. The costumes were handed out at birth and can never be removed. The costumes cue everyone in the cast to the roles each character is to play and to each character's place on the stage. Over the run of the show, the cast has grown accustomed to who plays which part. For generations, everyone has known who is center stage in the lead. Everyone knows who the hero is, who the supporting characters are, who is the sidekick good for laughs, and who is in shadow. The undifferentiated chorus with no lines to speak, no voice to sing but necessary for the production to work. The roles become sufficiently embedded into the identity of the players that the leading man or woman would not be expected so much as to know the names or take notice of the people in the back, and there would be no need for them to do so. Stay in the roles long enough, and everyone begins to believe that the roles are preordained, that each cast member is best suited by talent and temperament for their assigned role. And maybe for only that role, that they belong there and were meant to be cast as they are currently seen. Hey, the cast members become associated with their characters, typecast, locked into their inflated or disfavored assumptions. They become their characters. As an actor, you are to move the way you are directed to move, speak the way your character is expected to speak. You are not yourself. You are not to be yourself. Stick to the script and to the part you are cast to play and you will be rewarded. Veer from the script and you will face the consequences. Veer from the script and other cast members will step in to remind you where you went off script. Do it often enough or at a critical moment and you may be fired, demoted, cast out, your character conveniently killed off in the plot. The social pyramid known as a caste system is not identical to the cast in a play, though the similarity in the two worlds hints at a tantalizing intersection. When we are cast into roles, we are not ourselves. We are not supposed to be ourselves. We are performing based on our place in the production, not necessarily on who we are inside. We are all players on a stage that was built long before our ancestors arrived in this land. We are the latest cast in a long running drama that premiered on this soil in the early 17th century. It was in late August, 1619, a year before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock that the Dutch man of war set anchor at the mouth of the James River at Point Comfort in the wilderness of what is now known as Virginia. We know this only because of a haphazard line in a letter written by the early settler John Rolfe. This is the oldest surviving reference to Africans in the English colonies in America, people who look different from the colonists and who would ultimately be assigned by law to the bottom of an emerging caste system. Rolfe mentions them as merchandise and not necessarily the merchandise the English settlers had been expecting. The ship, quote, brought not anything but 20 and odd Negroes. Rolf wrote, which the governor and Kate Marchant bought for victuals. I don't know what those are. I don't know if that's a lot or a little. V-I-C-T-U-A-L-L-E-S, whatever, bought for victuals. These Africans had been captured from a slave ship bound for the Spanish colonies, but were sold farther north to the British. Historians do not agree on what their status was, if they were bound in the short term for indentured servitude 
or relegated immediately to the status of lifetime enslavement, the condition that would befall most every human who looked like them arriving on these shores or born here for the next quarter millennium. The few surviving records from the time of their arrival show they, quote, held at the uh, outset a singularly debased status in the eyes of white Virginians, wrote the historian Alden T. Vaughn. If not yet consigned formally to permanent enslavement, quote, black Virginians were at least well on their way to such a condition. In the decades to follow, Colonial laws herded European workers and African workers into separate and unequal queues and set in motion the caste system that would become the cornerstone of the social, political, and economic system in America. This caste system would trigger the deadliest war on U.S. soil, lead to the ritual killings of thousands of subordinate caste people and lynchings, and become the source of inequalities that becloud and destabilize the country to this day. With the first rough attempts at colonial census, Conducted in Virginia in 1630, a hierarchy began to form. Few Africans were seen as significant enough to be listed in the census by name, as would be the case for the generations to follow, in contrast to the majority of European inhabitants, indentured or not. The Africans were not cited by age or arrival date, as were the Europeans, information vital to setting the terms and time frame for it, of indenture for Europeans or for Africans, had they been in the same category, been seen as equal, or seen as needing to be accurately accounted for. (laughs) Thus, before there was a United States of America, there was the caste system born in colonial Virginia. At first, religion, not race as we know it, defined the status of people in the colonies. Christianity, as a proxy for Europeans, generally exempted European workers from lifetime enslavement. This initial distinction is what condemned, first, indigenous people and then Africans, most of whom were not Christian upon arrival, to the lowest rung of an emerging emerging hierarchy before the concept of race had congealed to justify their eventual and total debasement. The creation of a caste system was a process of testing the bounds of human categories and not the result of a single edict. It was a decades-long sharpening of lines whenever the colonists had a decision to make. When Africans began converting to Christianity, they posed a challenge to a religion-based hierarchy. Hi, Bubby. Sorry, it's a little hot in here. It's a sunny day in Chicago, and we have lots of windows, which we like to have open on a sunny day. But uh, then, you know, it gets hot in the room when we're trying to keep the noise out, so sessions are are being made. Oh, can't have a hot puppy though, so we'll keep an eye on that. Um, <clears throat> uh, their efforts to claim a full <laughs> claim full participation in the colonies was an indirect opposition to the European hunger for the cheapest, most pliant labor to extract the most wealth from the New World. The strengths of African workers became their undoing. British colonists in the West Indies, for example, saw Africans as a civilized and relatively docile population who were, quote, accustomed to discipline and who cooperated well on a given task. Africans demonstrated an immunity to European diseases, making them more viable to the colonists than were the indigenous people the Europeans had originally tried to enslave. More pressingly, the colonies of the Chesapeake were faltering and needed manpower to cultivate tobacco. The colonies farther south were suited for sugarcane, rice, and cotton, crops with which the English had little experience, but that the Africans had either cultivated in their native lands or were quick to master. Period. The colonists soon realized that without Africans and the skills that they brought, their enterprises would fail, wrote the anthropologist Audrey and Brian Smedley. In the eyes of the European colonists and to the Africans' tragic disadvantage, they happened to bear an inadvertent birthmark over their entire bodies that should have been nothing more than a neutral variation in human experience. Uh, sorry, human appearance. Ooh, ooh, Freudian slip. Okay, Freudian slip. Sorry. Should have been nothing more than a neutral variation in human appearance, but which, would, which made them stand out from the English and Irish indentured servants. 
the Europeans could and did escape from their masters and blend into the general white population that was hardening into a single caste. The Gaelic insurrections caused the English to seek to replace the source of servile labor entirely with another source, African slaves, the Smedleys wrote. The colonists had been unable to enslave the native population on its own turf and believed themselves to have solved the labor problem with the Africans they imported. Imported! Oy, imported. With little further use from the, for the original inhabitants, the colonists began to exile them from their ancestral lands and from the emerging caste system. This left Africans firmly at the bottom, and by the late 1600s, Africans were not merely slaves. They were hostages subjected to unspeakable tortures that their captors documented without remorse. And there was no one on the planet willing to pay a ransom for their rescue. Mm. Americans are loath to talk about enslavement in part because what little we know about it goes against our perception of our country as a just and enlightened nation, a beacon of democracy for the world. Slavery is commonly dismissed as a sad, dark chapter in the country's history. It is as if the greater the distance we can create between slavery and ourselves, the better to stave off the guilt or shame it induces. So right, as if like that's the most important thing. Let's, that's not like it. <laughs> slavery, oh sorry. But in the same way that, oh, I know, someone's smoke detector or something. Sorry. Right. unfortunate. I hear you. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. But in the same way that individuals that individuals cannot move forward, become whole and healthy, unless they examine the domestic violence they witnessed as children or the alcoholism that runs in their family. The country cannot become whole until it confronts what was not a chapter in its story, but the basis of its economic and social order. For a quarter millennium, slavery was the country. Oof, I'm sorry, I'm yelling. That was good. Slavery was a part of everyday life, a spectacle that public officials and European visitors to the slaving provinces could not help but comment on with curiosity and revulsion. In a speech in the House of Representatives, a 19th century congressman from Ohio lamented that on, quote, the beautiful avenue in front of the Capitol, members of Congress during this session have been compelled to turn aside from their path to to permit a coffle of slaves, male and females, chained to each other by their necks to pass on their way to this national slave market. The Secretary of the U.S. Navy expressed horror at the sight of the barefoot men and women locked together with the weight of an ox chain in the beating sun, forced to walk the distance to damnation in a state farther south and riding behind them. Quote, a white man on horseback carrying pistols in his belt and who, as we passed him, had the impudence to look us in the face without blushing. The Navy official, James K. Paulding, said, when they, the slaveholders, permit such flagrant and indecent outrages upon humanity as that I have described, when they sanction a villain in thus marching half-naked women and men loaded with chains, with, with chains, with, loaded with chains, without being charged with a crime, but that of being black, from one section of the United States to another, hundreds of miles in the face of day, they disgrace themselves and the country to which they belong. I want to just let for now, because it's hot in here. Okay, let's, let's take a break. It's the first sunny day we've had in a while. These are good problems. All right, to combat the heat, we have cracked open a window and opened the door. So hopefully the audio is still good, but I do live in a neighborhood with activity outside pretty often. So everyone's been warned. <laughs> Back to it uh, on page 44. 
Slavery in this land was not merely an unfortunate thing that happened to black people. It was an American innovation, an American institution created by and for the benefit of the elites of the do dominant caste and enforced by poorer members of the dominant caste who tied their lot to the caste system, rather to their consciences. Oof. It made lords of everyone in the dominant caste, as law and custom stated that, quote, submission is required of the slave, not to the will of the master only, but to the will of all other white persons. And they capitalize all of that. The white persons is like capitalized and slaves is capitalized. Like those are their official titles. Anyway, it was not merely a torn thread in an otherwise perfect cloth, wrote the sociologist Steven Steinberg. It would be closer to say that slavery provided the fabric out of which the cloth was made. Steven Steinberg. All right, sounds Jewish. Okay. All right, brother. <clears throat> American slavery, which lasted from 1619 to 1865, gross, was not the slavery of ancient Greece or the illicit sex slavery of today. The abhorrent, the abhorrent, and I'm so not good at that word, and I'm going to take a sip of water. The abhorrent slavery of today is unreservedly illegal. And any current day victim who escapes, escapes to a world that recognizes her freedom and will work to punish her enslaver. I read that wrong, but you get it. The, the, the slavery of today is illegal and whatever. We recognize that we should not be enslaved at least today. Well, most of us do. Things have changed since she wrote this th three years ago. Oh, goodness, Isabel. I wonder what you would say to today, right now. Um, oof. American slavery, by contrast, was legal and sanctioned by the state and a web of enforcers. Any victim who managed to escape, escaped to a world that not only did not recognize her freedom, but would return her to her captors for further unspeakable horrors as retribution. Yeah. In American slavery, the victims not the enslavers were punished, subject to whatever atrocities the enslaver could devise as a lesson to others. What the colonists created was, quote, an extreme form of slavery that had existed nowhere in the world, wrote the legal historian Ariella J. Gross. For the first time in history, one category of humanity was ruled out of the human race and into a separate subgroup that was to remain enslaved for generations in perpetuity. The institution of slavery was, for a quarter millennium, the conversion of human beings into currency, into machines who existed solely for the profit of their owners, to be worked as long as the owners desired, who had no rights over their bodies or loved ones, who could be mortgaged, bred, won in a bet, given as wedding presents, bequeathed to their heirs, sold away from spouses or children to cover an owner's debt, or to spite a rival, or to settle an estate. They were regularly whipped, raped, and branded, subjected to any whim or distemper of the people who owned them. Some were castrated or endured other tortures too grisly for these pages, tortures that the Geneva Conventions would have banned as war crimes had the conventions applied to people of African descent on this soil. Before there was a United States of America, there was enslavement. Theirs was a living death passed on for 12 generations. The slave, quote, the slave is doomed to toil that others may reap the fruits, is how a letter writer identifying himself as Judge Ruffin testified to what he saw in the Deep South. Quote, the slave is entirely subject to the will of his master, quote, William Goodell, a minister who chronicled the institution of slavery in the 1830s. What he chooses to inflict upon him, he must suffer. He must never lift a hand in self-defense. He must utter no word of remonstrance. Remonstrance. He has no protection and no redress. Fewer than the animals of the field. They were seen as not capable of being injured, Goodell wrote. They may be punished at the discretion of their lord or even put to death by his authority. 
as a window into their exploitation. Consider that in 1740, South Carolina, like other slaveholding states, finally decided to limit the workday of enslaved African Americans to 15 hours from March to September and to 14 hours from September to March. Double the normal workday for humans who actually get paid for their labor. In that, oh gosh, if that don't. Ooh, okay. In that same era, prisoners found guilty of actual crimes were kept to a maximum of 10 hours per workday. Let no one say that African Americans as a group have not worked for our country. For the ceaseless exertions of their waking hours, many subsisted on a peck of corn a week, which they had to mill by hand at night after their labors in the field. Some owners denied them even that as punishment and allowed meat for protein only once a year. They were scarcely permitted to pick up crumbs that fell from their master's tables, George Whitefield wrote, Whitefield wrote. Stealing food was a, quote, a crime punished by flogging. Your slaves, I believe, work as hard, if not harder, than the horses whereon you ride, Whitefield wrote in an open letter to the colonies of the Chesapeake in 1739. Quote, these, after their work is done, are fed and taken proper care of. The horses. Enslavers bore down on their hostages to extract the most profit, whipping those who fell short of impossible targets and whipping all the harder those who exceeded them to wring more from their exhausted bodies. Whipping was a gateway form of violence that led to bizarrely creative levels of sadism, wrote the historian Edward Baptist. Enslavers use every modern method of torture, he observed, from mutilation to waterboarding. Slavery made the enslavers among the richest people in the world, granting them, quote, the ability to turn a person into cash at the shortest possible notice. This is why I hate capitalism so much. But from the time of enslavement, Southerners minimized the horrors they inflicted and to which they had grown accustomed. Quote, no one was willing, he wrote, to admit that they lived in an economy whose bottom gear was torture. The vast majority of African Americans who lived in this land in the first 246 of what is now the years of what is now the United States lived under the terror of people who had absolute power over their bodies and their very breath, subject to people who faced no sanction for any atrocity they could conjure. Oh, yeah. They could conjure. I said <laughs> conjure. <laughs> Ooh, cracked my neck. Ooh, cracked it again. That was good. I should have warned you. <laughs> Quote, this fact is of great significance for the understanding of racial conflict, wrote the sociologist Guy B. Johnson, for it means that the white people during the long period of slavery became accustomed to the idea of regulating Negro insolence and insubordination by force with the consent and approval of the law. Karen. Slavery so perverted the balance of power that it made the degradation of the subordinate caste seem normal and righteous. In the gentlest houses drifted now and then the sound of dragging chains and shackles, the bay of the hounds, the report of pistols on the trail of the runway. Uh, Oh, report, the report of pistols on the trail of the runaway. That's what it's called? Wrote Southern writer Wilbur, Wilbur J. Cash. Quote, and as the advertisements of the time incontestably prove, mutilation and the mark of the branding iron. The most respected and beneficent of society people oversaw forced labor camps that were politely called plantations, <laughs> concentrated with hundreds of unprotected prisoners whose crime was that they were born with dark skin. Good and loving mothers and fathers, pillars of their communities, personally inflicted gruesome tortures upon their fellow human beings. For the horrors of the American Negro's life, wrote James Baldwin, there has been almost no language. This was what the United States was for longer, was for longer than it was not. So, I mean, I think, yeah. So it's been this way longer than it hasn't been. Yes, it is a measure of how long enslavement lasted in the United States that the year 2022 marks the first year that the United States will have been an independent nation for as long as slavery lasted on its soil. No current day adult will be alive 
in the year in which African Americans as a group will have been free for as long as they had been enslaved. That will not come until the year 2111. 2111. It would take a civil war, the deaths of three quarters of a million soldiers and civilians, the, assassin the assassination of a president, Abraham Lincoln, and the passage of the 13th Amendment to bring the institution of enslavement in the United States of America to an end. For a brief window of time, the 12 years known as Reconstruction, the North sought to rebuild the South and help the 4 million people who had been newly liberated. But the federal government withdrew for political expediency in 1877 and left those in the subordinate caste in the hands of the very people who had enslaved them. Sounds about white. Yeah, this is going well. Okay, you got it. Let We don't ever have to maintain this. Okay, cool. <laughs> now... Nursing resentments from defeat in the war, people in the dominant caste took out their hostilities on the subordinate caste with fresh tortures and violence to restore their sovereignty in a reconstituted caste system. The dominant caste devised a labyrinth of laws to hold the newly freed people on the bottom rung ever more tightly, while a new popular new pseudoscience called eugenics worked to justify the renewed debasement. People on the bottom rung could be beaten or killed with impunity for any breach of the caste system, like not stepping off the sidewalk fast enough or trying to vote. <laughs> the colonists made decisions that created the caste system long before the arrival of the ancestors of the majority of the people who now identify as Americans. The dominant caste controlled all resources, controlled whether when and if a black person would eat, sleep, reproduce, or live. The colonists created a caste of people who would, by definition, be seen as dumb because it was illegal to teach them to read or write, as lazy to justify the bullwhip, as immoral to justify rape and forced breeding, as criminal because the colonists made the natural response to kidnap, flogging, and torture, the human impulse to defend oneself or break free, a crime if one were black. Stop resisting. Thus, each new immigrant, the ancestors of most current day Americans, walked into a pre-existing hierarchy, bipolar in construction, arising from slavery and pitting the extremes in human pig pigmentation at opposite ends. Each new immigrant had to figure out how and where to position themselves in the hierarchy of their adopted new land. Oppressed people from around the world, particularly from Europe, passed through Ellis Island, shed their old selves and often their old names to regain admittance to the powerful, dominant majority. Somewhere in the journey, Europeans became something they had never been or needed to be before. They went from being Czech or Hungarian or Polish to white, a political designation that only has meaning when set against something not white. They would join a new creation, an umbrella category for anyone who entered the new world from Europe. Germans gained acceptance as part of the dominant caste in the 1840s, according to immigration and legal scholar Ian Haney Lopez. The Irish in the 1850s to the 1880s and the Eastern and Southern Europeans in the early 20th century. It was becoming American that they became white. Oh, it was in becoming American that they became white. Right. Because once you get here, race. Cool. In Ireland or Italy, Lopez wrote, whatever social or racial identities these people might have possessed, being white wasn't one of them. Serbs and Albanians, Swedes and Russians, Turks and Bulgarians who might have been at war with one another back in their mother countries were fused together on the basis not of a shared ethnic culture or language or faith or national origin, but solely on the basis of what they look like in order to strengthen the dominant caste in the hierarchy. No one was white before he or she came to America, James Baldwin once said. Their geographic origin was their passport to the dominant caste. The European immigrants' experience was decisively shaped by their entering an arena where Europeanness, that is to say whiteness, was among the most important possessions one could have. One could lay claim to. Sorry, I tried to predict what the next page was going to say. <laughs> wrote the Yale historian Matthew Fry J Jacobson. It was their whiteness, not any kind of new world magnanimity. 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 That opened the golden door. 
To gain acceptance, each fresh infusion of immigrants had to enter into a silent, unspoken pact of separating and distancing themselves from the established, the established lowest caste. Becoming white meant defining themselves as furthest from its opposite, black. They could establish their new status by observing how lowest, how the lowest caste was regarding and imitating or one-upping the disdain and contempt, learning the epithets, joining in on violence against them to prove themselves worthy of admittance to the dominant caste. They might have arrived as neutral innocents, but would have been forced to choose sides if they were to survive in their adopted land. Here, they had to learn how to be white. Thus, Irish immigrants, who would not have had anything against any one group upon arrival and were escaping famine and persecution of their own under the British, were pitted against black residents when they were drafted to fight a war over slavery from which they did not benefit and that they did not cause. Hmm. Unable to attack the white elites who were sending them to war and who had pro prohibited black men from enlisting, Irish immigrants turned their frustration and rage against the scapegoats who they by now knew were beneath them in the American hierarchy. They hung black men from lamp poles and turned to the ground anything associated with black people. Homes, businesses, churches, a black orphanage in the draft riots of 1863, considered the largest race riot in American history. A century later and in living memory, some 4,000 Italian and Polish immigrants went on a rampage when a black veteran tried to move his family into the all-white suburb of Cicero, Illinois in 1951. Hostility towards the lowest caste became part of the initiation rite into citizenship in America. Thus, people who had descended from Africans became the unifying foil in solidifying the caste system, the bar against which all others could measure themselves approvingly. It was not just that various white immigrant groups' economic successes came at the expense of non-whites, Jacobson wrote, <laughs> but they, that they owe their now stabilized and broadly recognized whiteness itself in part to those non-white groups. The institution of slavery created a crippling distortion of human relationships where people on one side were made to perform the role of subservience and to sublimate whatever innate talents or in intelligence they might have had. They had to suppress their grief over the loss of children or spouses whose bodies had not died, but in a way had died because they had been torn from them never to be seen again and at the hands of the very people they were forced to depend upon for their very breath. The reward for all this being that they might not be whipped that day or their remaining son or daughter might not be taken from them this time. Mm. the dangers of, of cracking a window and living next door to a, like, fruit market. How dare they get deliveries, Fran? On the other side, the dominant caste lived under the illusion of an innate superiority over all other groups of humans, told themselves that the people they forced to work for up to 18 hours without the pay that anyone had a right to expect were not, in fact, people, but beasts of the field, childlike creatures, not men, not women, that the performance of servility that had been flogged out of them arose from genuine respect and admiration for their innate glory. Mm. Not, the, not the beating. Okay. These disfigured relationships were handed down through the generations. The people whose ancestors had put them atop the hierarchy grew accustomed to the unearned deference from the subjugated group and came to expect it. They told themselves that the people beneath them did not feel pain or heartache, were debased machines that only looked human and upon whom one could inflict any atrocity. The people who told themselves these things were telling lies to themselves. Their lives were to some degree a lie and in dehumanizing these people whom they regarded as beasts of the field, they dehumanized themselves. Americans of today have inherited these distorted rules of engagement, whether or not their family had enslaved people or had even been in the United States. Slavery built the man-made chasm between blacks and whites that forces the middle castes of Asians, Latinos, indigenous people, and new immigrants of African descent to navigate within 
what began as a bipolar hierarchy. Newcomers learned to vie for the good favor of the dominant caste and to distance themselves from the bottom dwellers as if everyone were in the grip of an invisible playwright. They learned to conform to the dictates of the ruling caste if they are to prosper in their new land. A shortcut being to contrast themselves with the degraded lowest caste, to use them as the historic foil against which to rise in a harsh every man for himself economy. By the late 1930s, as war and authoritarianism were brewing in Europe, the caste system in America was fully in force and into its third century. Its operating principles were evident all over the country. The caste was enforced without quarter in the authoritarian Jim Crow regime of the former Confederacy. Quote, caste in the South, wrote anthropologists W. Lloyd Warner and Allison Davis, is a system for arbitrarily defining the statues, the status. <laughs> it's good. I'm almost at the end. <laughs> Um, arbitrarily defining the status of all Negroes and of all whites with regard to the most fundamental privileges and opportunities of human society. It would become the social, economic, and psychological template at work in one degree or another for generations. A few years ago, a Nigerian-born playwright came to a talk that I gave at British Library at a British library in London. He was intrigued by the lecture. The idea that six million African Americans had to seek political asylum within the borders of their own country during the Great Migration, a history that she had not known of. She talked with me afterward and said something that I've never forgotten that startled me in its simplicity. Quote, you know that there are no black people in Africa, she said. Most Americans weaned on the myth of drawable lines between human, human beings have to sit with that statement. It sounds nonsensical to our ears. Of course there are black people in Africa. There's a whole continent of black people in Africa. How could anyone not see that? Africans are not black, she said. They are Igbo and Yoruba, Iwe, Akan, Mbele. They are not black. They are just themselves. They are humans on the land. That is how they see themselves, and that is who they are. What we take as gospel in American culture is alien to them, she said. They don't become black until they go to America or come to the UK, she said. It is then that they become black. Cloud. Oh. It was in the making of the new world that Europeans became white, Africans black, and everyone else yellow, red, or brown. It was in the making of the new world that humans were set apart on the basis of what they look like, identified solely in contrast to one another, and ranked to form a caste system based on a new concept called race. It was in the process of ranking that we were all cast into assigned roles to meet the needs of the larger production. None of us are ourselves. All right, Ms. Wilkerson. Just hit me with it. And that's chapter four. <sighs> Arbitrary construction of human, ooh, I'm whistling today, of human divisions. We're not ourselves. We're just out here playing, do do do, I am millennial. Like, oh, Isabel. Love to see it. Fran's comfortable. I hope you enjoyed this. See you next time.